Good morning, church family, and good job, Abigail. Such a blessing. Um, our scripture reading for today is Isaiah 1, 18. And it says, Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. Hello, everyone. All right, so if you guys have made notice in your bulletins, our pastor speaking today is Dean Steve. And on behalf of Thunderbird Adventist Academy, I would just personally like to say that we are so grateful and so thankful to have him come back to minister his words and to just um, connect and talk to us again. And with him, we have this little um, card that we wrote to him, and I just hope that you appreciate it and that you fly back safe and come back, period. Give it up for Dean Steve. Good morning. I am really, really happy to be here today. Um, over the years, I have heard uh, many words used to describe me. Um, inquisitive, curious, talkative, Loud, I've, I've heard loud a lot. Um, precocious, eccentric, to name a few. But my favorite word uh, ever used to describe me is rambunctious. Marion Webster defines rambunctious this way. It says, uh, the first entry is uh, either difficult to control or handle, wildly boisterous. And, and number two, turbulently active and noisy. And that's my favorite description of me because it is 100% accurate. Uh, my, my mother used to tell me that she would pray that one day I would have a child of my own that was like me so that I could understand what the experience was like for her. And I used to laugh whenever she said that. And then I became a dean here. And I am here to tell you, church, that God answers prayer in a very big way. Uh, I, would, I would call her, I would call her a lot, but at least once a month on those calls, I would find myself apologizing, and, and she, you know, often she'd be like, for what? Well, like, what are you sorry for? I'm like, I don't know, 1987, like all of it? Like, just, I'm sorry, I get it now. Um, and in my defense, most of my antics were good-natured and adorable. But I would still do things from time to time that would require discipline. And I can think of one Sabbath morning in particular. I was, I was maybe four at the most. Um, and I can remember the church that I grew up in, it wasn't wide like this. It was kind of long. It was, it was, it was packed, though. It was, it was like 400-something people there on an average Sabbath morning when I was a little kid. And my parents would sit in the same place every single Sabbath, right? Um, from, from my perspective up here, it would have been second row on my right-hand side every Sabbath. I, I don't know if there was like a reserve sign for my pops. I don't know what it was, but they were there every single day. And most of the time when I was there, I was relatively well-behaved. But this particular Sabbath, I must have had some cinnamon toast crunch for breakfast or something. I was worked up. I was loud. And despite my father's best efforts, nothing was quieting me down. He, he even counted to three which is like, that's, that's if, if you know my pops, yeah, that's, that's some of you have, have been there, right? Where it's just, you, you know the power of three. <laughs> I, I kind of feel bad for my first grade teacher because when we started arithmetic and we got to two, she had to ask me why I was hiding under my desk. <laughs> but even that, it wasn't enough this morning. I was just, I was, I was in the spirit. And so my dad waited for a little lull in the service with the intention of taking me outside and administering discipline. And to do that, it meant that we would have to get up from this spot and walk out into like a little breezeway off to, I guess, my left, your right. And so he, he waited, things kind of quieted down, there was that little space. He takes me by the hand, gets up, and we start across. And we made it to about here when I stopped 
and turned and looked at the 400 people in the congregation and with a smile on my face, I said, pray for me. And I walked out in the breezeway. I was very, very pleased with myself because even before I knew, I was like, ah, I have won their hearts and minds. And I can never, I'll never forget my dad's reaction. He, my, my dad is an animated individual, and so I'm kind of used to him when he's yelly and screamy and bouncy and ah. Uh, I get worried when he gets quiet. And he got real quiet, and he knelt down so that he was on my eye level. And he said, you have bought yourself some time, but they don't go home with you. And when we get home, we're going to have a talk. And it reminded me of, of an instance in Scripture where some rebellious children were in need of discipline. If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, the first chapter. And as we're, as we're going there, a little bit of backstory as we begin. Um, the author sets the scene by being given a vision that he says was concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah kings of Judah. Now, if you're like me, when you hear those names, your eyes sort of glaze over a little bit, and you have a tendency to just move right past the little list and get into the meat of the text. But as I was, I was, as I was looking at these things, I, I found that these names were rather important for a couple of reasons. First, it provides a historical context for what is going on in the world, right? I love history, and so I, I I like to see what other things are happening in, in connection to the Bible story because I think it's easy to sort of forget where things are in that timeline. We get into the biblical timeline and things sort of get lost in the ribbon of kings and these names. So I started looking and these are some of the things I found were happening in and around the time that these uh, listed kings served. Um, we learn when, when I dig that, that King Isaiah died in the year 740, 739 B.C., and continuing on up through the death of Hezekiah, the last king mentioned in the list, we end up in 687 or 686 B.C. So we have a rough idea of that timeline that Isaiah is ministering in. And if we look at the world at large during that timeline, we see that some interesting things are happening or have just happened in relation to this. Um, just 250 years before this narrative begins, gunpowder was invented in China. I didn't think it was that old, but... 250 years old at the time of the start. Um, the first games to honor Zeus had taken place just 36 years before this timeline starts on the Olympic plain. Sometime during the run of this, uh, in between the years 750 and 700 BC, Th Homer has thought to have written the Iliad and the Odyssey, two of my favorite books. Um, according to legend, on April the 21st, 753 BC, Rome was thought to have been founded by Romulus and Remus. That's only 13 years before Isaiah begins his ministry. So he, we, we kind of get an idea then that Isaiah is living at a time where the geopolitical landscape was, let's say, volatile. Right? Specifically for the children of, of Judah and Israel, uh, Assyria was the dominant power in the Middle East and the Mediterranean, and that's going to play an important part in this narrative as we look at this thing. Um, it, was, it was during Isaiah's ministry, in fact, that the northern kingdoms of Israel would be invaded, besieged, and, and eventually eradicated by the Assyrian Empire. Like, they, they disappear from the face of history, leaving only the small kingdoms in Judah. And they would be a continual threat to Jerusalem and Judah during most, if not all, of Isaiah's tenure as prophet. And in addition to politics, the list of names gives us an idea of the spiritual condition of Judah as well. I'm not going to go into depth today uh, on that because I could spend hours nerding about all the little details and things like that of the reigns of these guys. But broadly put, the spiritual condition of Judah under the leadership of these four was up and down. And honestly, when we look at it, corruption and complacency were the order of the day during much of the events that take place under these administrations. So it's with all that in mind that we begin to look at what Isaiah says in this message that he receives from the Lord. Let's start in verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, 
offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. For the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but just bruises and sores and raw wounds. They're not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land, desolate as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. So as I looked at that, one thing immediately stood out to me, and that was the language that God uses to describe Judah, specifically where he, he talks about them being sick and unsound and in ill health. Because as I looked at that list of kings, what I found was that condition of sickness was reflected in their physical well-being. King Isaiah, towards the end of his reign, uh, was afflicted with leprosy. He'd been to the temple, he had done something he wasn't supposed to be doing, and, 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 and it was so bad that he was actually removed from the day-to-day running of the kingdom. They had to separate him completely from any activity, lest he contaminate his offspring, his heirs, and threaten the viability of the kingdom moving forward. So for the last 11 or 12 years of his reign or so, he was a figurehead, and his son ran the day-to-day operations. In fact, his leprosy was so bad that when he died, they didn't even bury him in the ground with his ancestors. They had a separate plot of land specifically for him so that even in death, he would not corrupt what he touched. Hezekiah as well, and we know that story. He, he dealt with an illness, and he, he, he desperately pleaded to God, and God reversed things for him. He gave him the sign of the uh, sundial as the thing, but, but even in the physical stature of these kings as they serve, we, we see a sickness, and it's reflected in this language of God, right? They, they, they were sort of rotten to the core, both, both from a civil standpoint and from a religious standpoint, right? They, they did everything that they could to give the false impression that things were okay. On the civil front, alliances were made with Egypt in an attempt to ensure that the image of strength and security inspired confidence that Judah would not suffer the same fate that the northern kingdoms of Israel had suffered. And spiritually, the rituals, the rites, the feasts, and traditions that had forged and formed the Jewish national identity were proudly put on display as proof of the piety and prosperity that came from being God's chosen nation. But while outwardly claiming that they put their trust in the Lord, the reality was that God's people were living in such a way that they showed that their faith was actually rooted not in their Savior, but in their national identity. It was rooted in their material prosperity. It was rooted in their adherence to the appearance of religious fidelity. See, Judah claimed to embrace and accept the call to be God's priests to the nation and to prepare the world for the coming of the Holy One of Israel, Jesus. But instead, it says in verse 4 here that they had forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They were utterly estranged from their father. All these feasts and festivals, all the rituals and traditions that were meant to draw people's attention to Jesus and his ministry, it did nothing. They had replaced him. It, it, It was the observance that became the focus of their hearts and minds. God's children had rushed past rambunctious. They had embraced rebellion under the guides of religion, and God was giving this vision to Isaiah to let his children know that we need to talk. Let's continue in verse 10 to see exactly what God has to say to them. He says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the, well, the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who is required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense 
is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, this is God speaking to his children, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. That is not a pleasant conversation. It is a frank and honest assessment of the spiritual condition of Judah, and in it, God lays out his case for his children's need of accountability and discipline. He spells out the truth that it's not the performance of religious rites or public displays of worship that bring his people into a right standing with him, but rather it's a sincere change of heart and behavior that can only occur when the children of Judah surrender their lives to him completely. Only by the substitution and sacrifice that takes place by Jesus' death on the cross will salvation be possible. And God lays out in simple and plain language the evidence of what that salvation, once accepted, will look like. We read in verse 16 and 17, and God says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, and cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice, bring, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. And if we stop right there, and in that conversation, it's a very bleak outlook for God's children. He seemingly leaves them with this diagnosis that they are corrupt, they are sinful, they are inauthentic and rotten, and the only way to make things right is to embrace these values, and they have shown that they are not capable of doing that. They lack the willpower the strength to turn things around on their own. And if God leaves the situation there, what hope do they have? What I love about this, though, is this, this is not a one-sided conversation, right? God doesn't just present all this, tell them to shut up and deal with it, and accept that they find themselves in a hopeless situation. Beginning in verse 18, and we've already heard it this morning, God invites them to come and reason with him. He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as so. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. I love that imagery. I love that description. Maybe it's because I'm, I'm a ginger, and so I understand what it means to be red like crimson. A couple of minutes under any light source, and I begin, like, this, this jacket is designed to camouflage if I get sunburned, right? So, so I, I understand. That it's, it's noticeable when <laughs> this stands out. And he is telling them that you could have done things so terrible that it is unavoidable knowing how bad you are. But that doesn't matter because if you allow me to become your God. If you accept the salvation and the forgiveness that I am offering you through my son, Jesus, I can take anything, no matter how severe, no matter how much you feel like it stained you to your very core, I can take it and I can eradicate it. I can make it like it never existed. You may think you are red as scarlet, but I will make you pure as fresh wool. They're offered this hope that all that is necessary for them to be reconciled to God is a willing heart that accepts this gift of salvation. The evidence that they have that heart will be the transformation of their behavior from rebellion to obedience. And I love that because this, I, I really feel that this speaks to who we are and our situation today. I mean, there's so many parallels that we can draw from as we look at this description. Uh, in scripture of, of the world at large and, and, and spiritual nature of us as, as his family. The mindset that many who profess to believe hold to that salvation can be found through their own works is evident 
in many who claim to believe. Um, God is attempting to clear up the confusion that comes with that idea that we can be the authors of our own salvation. God is making it clear that if we attempt to earn it through our own efforts, he will consider it inauthentic worship. Only a life lived in true worship will be found pleasing to the Holy One of Israel. And what does true worship look like? It says it right here in Scripture. We surrender our lives to Christ. We let his love transform who we are. We let the blood of Jesus cleanse us and eradicate from us any trace of sin in our lives. We let God's love be evident in the way that we live because we live a radically changed life. That is the evidence that we have accepted the gift of salvation. When we no longer live a life that is selfishly centered on our own actions or self-interests, but rather live in obedience and cease to do evil and learn to do good. People will know that it's not in us to remove the corruption of sin from our own lives. So, when they see us seek justice, when they see us stand up against oppression, when they see us speak out for the voiceless and the helpless and love others the way that we've been loved, even if it means we're still enemies, they will know that it is because there is no question that our lives have been transformed because we've experienced the precious love of Jesus. His love is a love that accepts us as we are, but it does not leave us how it finds us. His love is a love that when we live it out in authentic worship, will have people asking us, how can I experience that? What makes your life different? Who do you know? And when that question is asked, it'll give us the opportunity to share with them the answer, Jesus. And with a smile on our face, we can sit down with them and say, you know what? I can explain to you exactly why my life has been changed. We should talk. 